Contact podcast and welcome back to the new setup. Well, I guess initially just welcome in general. You've never been here before. So I have. That's why it's stuck in my head. I've tried to record this video one other time and failed miserably. So we'll see how this goes. So we've gotten rid of the couch. I know I am torn up inside. It was a good couch. It went to a good home. And the next guest that you will actually see is the one whose home it went into. So it's definitely going to be well-loved and the legacy of the beautiful orange couch will continue. But I thought this was a little bit more intimate. I know you can't see the other side where the guest is going to be sitting, but it's another one of these chairs. And I did put them together myself, uh, independent woman over here. It was extremely easy, if I'm being quite honest. And yeah, I thought this was a little bit more comfy, cozy. Each person has their own personal space. And hopefully that makes it, you know, just a little bit of a different vibe. I know that the chairs are very matchy-matchy to the curtains behind me. So I feel like that will help us stand out from the background as well. Because I think sometimes when my guests would wear or my old co-host would wear certain colors, it would wash everything out. So Long story short, I'm trying to technically make this better in any way that I can so it's more pleasurable for you to enjoy. And if you cannot see me, head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash at Conscious Contact Podcast, and you can see the full video versions of all these episodes. In today's episode, I wanted to talk about me, I guess. That sounds really selfish. Um, well, I mean, it is. I didn't know if there was going to be anything that anyone listening wanted to know personally about me. I know that we talk a lot about really deep stuff and we've talked a little bit about everything on this podcast, but kind of threw it out there on Instagram and Twitter to see if anyone had anything specific that they wanted to ask and hopefully I'll have an answer for you or not. We shall see. So first question, is laughter the best medicine? I think so. I I think that unless you can laugh at the world, yourself, and any misfortune misfortunes that might, you know, come to pass, there's really not another way of coping for me. And I choose my friends solely on how funny they are. So I guess I do definitely agree with that statement. Uh, laughter is for sure the best medicine. Next one is just self-love. It wasn't a question at all. It was just a statement. I only really have one thing to say on this because I have not ever really struggled with self-esteem issues in particular, but I do know the feeling of not having a purpose or not thinking that you're good enough. And what I've learned is self-esteem comes from doing esteemable acts. So the more that you can do for others, the more you can get outside of yourself, the more you can focus on another person, the better you feel about yourself. And it's a catch-22, you know, it doesn't really make any sense. But the less that I think about me, the better I feel about me. And hopefully that that translates. What do you do when you aren't feeling good or like yourself? So I... <laughs> <laughs> these are my coping skills only. So please don't take this as like advice. You probably shouldn't do anything I do, but it's pretty standard. So some kind of carb, whether that's mac and cheese or a singular tortilla rolled up and eaten a slice of bread, something extremely carby um, that normally will, you know, fill a hunger void if that's there or kind of jumpstart my endorphins <laughs> with carbs uh, so eating some kind of comfort food, taking some quiet time, um, like as soon as I realize something's off, vocalizing that to other people around me so that they can kind of give me the reality of the situation or just so that they know so that I'm, I'm not going to make them feel like any of my reactions have anything to do with them. I do try to control my reactions, but if I am really in a funk I try to make sure the people I love that are around me know that so that they don't take things personally. And puzzles. I have used puzzles as a stress relief mechanism for absolutely forever. I actually, I should have, by the time this episode goes out, an affiliate link for the most genius company that I've ever seen. So I do a ton of puzzles and I'm running out of room. 
because the boxes are, are not small. And I do like a thousand piece puzzles, Charles Wysocki mostly. And there is this company called Completing the Puzzle. And it's a membership service, kind of like Netflix. And they send you a puzzle in a bag, like one or however many you want a month, I think. And you do the puzzle and then you send it back. <laughs> so you don't have to store it at your house. So they are not a sponsor currently, but they could be. The um, They've offered to give me an affiliate link. So that way, if you go over there and check it out, they'll know that I sent you. So that's definitely helpful for me. And I think the puzzles would be helpful for you. I'm definitely not a self-help podcast, but I definitely feel such a huge sense of calm when I'm putting together a puzzle. I, that is probably the biggest one for me, whether it is a physical jigsaw puzzle or um, playing like a puzzle type game on my phone. The, that would be my go-to and just really trying to sit with it while I'm putting together that thing or playing the game and letting those thoughts mull over in my head and figure out what's really underneath all of that. Like, why do I actually feel off or not like myself? Hope that answered your question. What kind of animals do you want to have after you move? So if you do not already follow Acme Acres, that is Luke and I's channel together. We are building a house in the middle of nowhere, which is exactly how we want it. We've got a lot of acreage and uh, I'm hoping to have some farm animals once we're actually living out there. So I know I want chickens, definitely that pretty early on. I want to milk cow really badly. So it'll go in between one cow and two cows because she'll have a baby. Um, it could potentially grow beyond that, but I have no skills in this area, so I am complete noob. I'm going to see how I get on, probably with chickens. Uh, the gateway drug of animals is what they've been called, so we'll see <laughs> what happens. Um, I, I love cows. Um, I would be into sheep, honestly. I love sheep. I think they're, they're really sweet, and their temperaments, if you can keep them confined, seem to be pretty good. Um, but yeah, a, a little bit of everything and also who knows, whatever the universe throws at me. The next one is what is your daily routine? I don't really have a daily routine per se. I have a daily flow is how I like to put it. So I don't have a rigid time that I try to wake up every morning. I don't have certain things I do at certain times of the day or on certain days of the week. I kind of fit it in wherever I can get it. So that is exercising or going on walks. Some of that is weather dependent. Some of it is if I've got a lot of stuff to do during the day, I might work out in the morning or in the evening. Um, meal times, kind of the same thing. Working time, um, editing this podcast and social posts and stuff like that. Those just fit in wherever. Cleaning the house, kind of the same thing. I, I really like routine and I'm trying to get back to that. But right now what's working is just a flow. Like, okay, here's the things I need to get done in a day and see where I can fit them in as the day progresses. That way I can kind of just like let life be life and go with the flow. Uh, but in the morning, for sure, I take some time by myself and meditate. If you've seen <laughs> my Instagram and I shared it over on the Renew Planner Instagram too, um, that's the planner company that I created for people in recovery from whatever. You can be in recovery from alcohol and drugs or from childhood trauma, um, but it's specifically made to kind of go along with whatever program you're using to work through that. And my meditation is uh, not the quiet ohm, you know, situation, my cat joins me every morning and she is very insistent that I pay attention to her. So what it ends up being is me sitting in silence or with her yelling in the background and petting her and trying to be present and, you know, just kind of taking, taking the day in before it starts. So also looking at what my to-do list is, do I have anywhere to go, that type of stuff. So not really a routine, but it's something. <laughs> it's better than nothing. Does pineapple belong on pizza? I used to say no, and now I say yes. I feel like that's kind of been my like growth into adulthood is mostly changing my mind on foods that I didn't used to like. So like olives, used to hate olives, love olives. Mustard, used to hate mustard, love mustard. There's a ton of stuff like that. Tomatoes. Um, just, you know, all the things that you think, ew, when you're a kid, like truly, 
myself and I'm an adult. I really like them Brussels sprouts. Probably my favorite food on the planet. But I would argue uh, Hawaiian pizza is not going to be my first choice if I'm ordering pizza. Um, that would probably be like just a thin New York style cheese, plain cheese. Uh, but I do like it. I think it's good. That's probably really controversial. <laughs> the next one is if vampires exist, do I believe that they are dead? My hard answer on this is no. They have cognitive function. Uh, so for me, I feel like there's something still happening there. So some kind of electrical impulse is still in the body that is making them be cognizant. You know what I mean? Like to have the mental capacity to interact in the world. And, you know, most vampire movies that you see, they're talking and stuff. They're not zombies. So I feel like there's some kind of life left and left in them for that to happen, for those neurons to fire like that. I don't feel like they can actually be dead but that could be an entire rabbit hole deep dive and I'm not going to go there if I had to move so like out of this state I can't, I can't pick this state what state would you move to and why this is a hard one I don't know um I've kind of lived here there and everywhere in the south um I think I'd probably want to try like Montana or Wyoming or Wisconsin or something like that. Something completely different to anywhere that I've lived before. Plains, um, flatland, surrounded by mountains maybe. Just to have something different. Um, before we bought the land that we're going to move to, we were looking at Tennessee. But I have lived in Tennessee before. And it's a great state. Um, lots of land available there. I ha haven't really explored Texas much. I think that would be really interesting. I think it might be a little too hot for Luke though. Um, and of course, Galax, Virginia is always on my list. If we just have to move for some reason, that's where, um, all of my mom's family lives. So that's on the list as well. Next one is, oh, wow. That's all right. We're getting deep here. Were you ever lost or trying to figure out what to do with your life after high school? Yeah. <laughs> Until like five years ago. Um, I took some, um, what are they called? certificate courses at the local community college. I got um, medical front office management. I got a certificate in that, which is basically like a semester work of worth of work. And they give you the skill set to be able to work in a medical front office. There's some billing and coding thrown in there. A lot of Excel, which is the bane of my existence. Uh, but yeah, I, I did that because I, I thought that that's kind of what I wanted to do. Management in general is something that I like because I'm a type A person and I'm very controlling. <laughs> so management is what I want to do, but what I should never do. Um, and I definitely didn't see myself ever being a homemaker, which is currently what I do for a living, technically. And that's just not how I was raised. I wasn't shown those skills either. So it's it was something brand new to me. And it's more fulfilling than anything else I think I could have picked. I definitely had a lot of random odd jobs. I mean, I've, I've done service industry and restaurant work um, and lots of other stuff in between that's not so PG. So I don't think any of those was really exactly what I needed or should have done and this outlet this podcast is definitely my current creative outlet because I do consider myself a creative person I've not found exactly where that avenue is truly like I don't I don't really know what I'm doing um and I'm not particularly skilled in anything but yeah I I think that it took me a really long time to figure out who I was first off because I was drinking alcoholically from 12 onward to be able to know who I was separate from that was the first piece of it. And then I kind of got to figure out everything else around that. But yeah, I think everyone feels lost <laughs> when they're trying to decide what to do after high school. So if you're asking that question because that's how you feel, you are not alone. <laughs> I promise. Favorite horror movie so far. This is really difficult um I didn't think about this at all before recording I if I had to pick one that I thought was a good combination of visually appealing um narrative that I really like 
and a storyline that I don't feel like has a ton of plot holes or is just not fathomable. It'd probably be High Tension. Um, I believe it's in French. And I'm not that artsy. I definitely listened to, listened and watched it um, with the English dub the first couple of times I've watched it. But I have since watched it with the subtitles just to kind of, you know, really immerse myself. I'm not going to say much about it because I don't want to give anything away. Um, I would highly recommend that you go watch it if you like horror movies. It is very gory, so keep that in mind. Uh, but I, I really, I really like that movie. Um, Hard Candy is another one that I really like. Uh, that's a pretty interesting spin on um, child predator behavior. It um, is also very gory, <laughs> and if you're a man, especially so, but it is really good. Uh, if I had to pick one that's like balls to the wall, crazy for no reason, Mandy is really interesting. If you're looking for a movie where you're just like, what the fuck the entire time, Mandy, def definitely a good one. Um, there's some, like I like campy stuff. I'm definitely a fan of the Evil Dead. Um, I, I like that kind of practical effect, body horror that's over the top um, and that but those are those are definitely the top for me for sure. What is my favorite flavor of wings? This is extremely specific. So there is a um, Korean American restaurant. It's a chain, so this is not like a hole in the wall place. I thought it was, and then I did my research. It's definitely not. Um, it's called Bonchon, and it's downtown in Greensboro. They've got them again. Like I said, they're all over the place, but they have the best freaking wings I don't know what they do to them the soy garlic is their signature and that's the one that I always get it is like heaven on earth I I know that my sodium levels go through the roof I do not care it is amazing if you like salty crunchy wings and like Asian flavors you will absolutely love those wings I'm really hungry now this was a terrible decision pizza and then wings okay I'm gonna move on how did you like Hogwarts legacy so Luke talked me into playing that. I'm not really a video game person. Like that's not on my like weekly agenda to play a certain game or anything. And I'm not a Harry Potter fanatic, but I am a Harry Potter fan. So he was definitely right. I really liked it. I played the whole game um, and I really enjoyed it. I think it's visually beautiful. They did a, an amazing job of recreating Hogwarts and all of the areas around it. The creatures are wonderful the gameplay is really nice. Um, I, I can't recommend it more. I mean, I, I did really, really enjoy it. So if you haven't played it, I don't know what you're doing, but you definitely need to. Someone said tips for building a home library. They are growing out of their bookshelves. Bookshelves are expensive, extremely expensive. Um, like, especially if you're not even talking about like a built-in library bookshelf, bookshelves in general, even from Ikea, like decent bookshelves that aren't going to fall apart are really expensive and they just, the, the sky's the limit. I was looking for a bookshelf option to use in this house, knowing that we're not going to stay here. So I didn't want to, you know, have something that was built in or something really expensive that I wasn't going to be able to use at the new house. Cause we, oh, well, I say we, I'm probably the only one that's going to be in there, but um, we are going to have an entire library room. Just, and that's all that's in there um, with like built in custom bookshelves and stuff. It's like the absolute dream. I am extremely lucky and I cannot, cannot wait for that. But in the meantime, I would recommend to go to your restaurant supply store or online at Restaurant Depot, I think is the name. No, that can't be it. I'll figure out the link and I'll put it below. It might just be called Restaurant Supply Store. Anything that is within that realm. They will have, and I'm looking at it right now, these big metal wire shelves. And I, you can get them as wide as you want, the shelves and the poles that hold them up as tall as you want. And I did that for the area that's on the other side of my wall here. And I just put a um, shelf liner on it to make sure no like skinnier books fell through. And a roll of that's like 20 bucks. It's amazing. It is the cheapest option, in my opinion, that still looks decent and is going to hold a crap ton of books. 
So that's what I would probably recommend. It's very industrial looking. So if that's not your vibe, I don't really know what to tell you. You might have to splurge a little bit or either make them yourself. But if you're just looking for storage period for your books and you don't want to have to keep getting rid of them, definitely restaurant supply type shelving, metal shelving. And they, I mean, they are secure. They are on there. What room do I look forward to decorating or hanging out in in the new house? Oh, this is hard. I mean, the library probably. <laughs> the kitchen is a huge one. Um, it is huge. And it is also something that I'm really interested in and kind of styling and putting antique pieces and stuff. And the breakfast area too. There's going to be a big gallery wall on one part of like the little room. It's an open wall to walk into it obviously but there um is a wall that's completely blank that we're I'm I say we again I'm sure Luke will have input but it'll be mostly me picking like what prints do I want or vintage frames or paintings or pieces of transferware or whatever and hanging them up there so I think that's probably probably the spot I'm looking forward to styling the most and hanging out in I'm ready to hang out outside <laughs> on the patio we've got a great landscape plan um and I just want to be out there you know and enjoy it for the reason that we bought the land which is the land itself so that's definitely the place I'm looking forward to chilling the most what is the first thing that you want to grow in your garden I am loosely starting to plan that now because I'm hoping towards the like towards fall time because we're not set to move in until the end of December which I'm going to automatically assume means January or February. <laughs> but I I think I'm probably just going to start with the things that we eat the most. So like carrots, tomatoes, celery, lettuces, um, that that kind of thing first. Like bump, are they called bumper crops? I might be misspeaking right now. But the things that we truly eat a lot of, potatoes, that type of stuff, and cut flowers because I do want to be able to enjoy that too and decorate the house with those and We've got a great area for that. Again, like if you want to see any of this progress, it's all documented. We have a YouTube channel and we share some like um, more frequent behind the scenes stuff on the Instagram. I think it's Acme Acres Life on Instagram and just Acme Acres on YouTube. And yeah, we're documenting it all. So if you're interested in any of this and you're like, what the hell is she talking about? Go over there. We've got the floor plans, the interior design stuff, the shots of the land, all of Luke's, you know, Pew pew ranges, all that stuff. Um, you can check it out over there. Dream vehicles. So Luke laughs at me. <laughs> One, because I changed my mind a lot. And two, because the two that I've kind of settled on um, that I might actually want to own and isn't just like a, oh, if I won this in the lottery or, you know, was gifted this or something is um, Land Rover Defenders and Enios, I'm hoping I'm saying that right. It's a British brand. They're heading over here to the United States this year at some point. It's called a Grenadier. And they are the most like utilitarian looking blocks ever. But in my head, you know, I'm envisioning when we move, uh, doing a lot of gardening and needing to haul things and having a four wheel drive off road capable vehicle to be able to use that on the land and to not have to be super precious about it. Um, I still will be because those are very expensive vehicles, but I think that the bang for your buck when it comes to the longevity of those two in particular, and I just love anything British, if I'm being quite honest. So there is an element of that too, but it is very like rugged and utilitarian, and I really like that. I think that's kind of the direction that I'm leaning. I love old, you know, super round, bubbly uh, 50s cars so that's definitely another interest of mine um I just think they're so pretty uh the rounded fenders and just the the detail and in the interiors and the crazy colors that they come in um I do really love a good you know 50s vintage anything really oh okay someone asked mannequins in the shooting range a la uh Halloween and I had to look up what scene <laughs> we're talking about because Halloween I like Halloween and Eric if you're watching or listening to this please do not kill me Halloween is great but that's not one of the ones that I've watched multiple times or remember a ton about and 
I think it'd be, it could be super creepy. I don't think it's really practical with how much we're going to be shooting. I think that they would get, you know, absolutely obliterated um, pretty quickly. But it is a definitely a creepy look. And come October, if um, I can find some cheap mannequins, I think that would be really fun to kind of set up and have it be ambiance and also functional. Favorite thing to bake? I really don't know. Cooking still makes me really anxious. <laughs> I really like other people being able to enjoy it. Um, but if I had to choose, it'd probably be bread. I, I do really like to make bread. Um, I try to make hollow once a week. I fell off on that for the first part of this year. And I don't, I don't know what it was. I was just stuck in my head, I guess. But got back into that. And I want to learn how to make sourdough. I've told myself, because I've tried this a lot. Let me just say that. Sourdough is a pain in the ass. I cannot get it to the point where I can make a loaf. Like I can get it started and then it'll look really good and suddenly it dies. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I don't know if it's this house. I don't know. I don't know what the issue is. So I've tried the dry sourdough method. I've tried a wet sourdough method. I've tried different hydration levels, different um, flour types. It's not working. So I told myself I'm not going to try again until we move <laughs> when I have time. And um, I definitely would love to do that. I think a good crusty loaf of bread is like the best thing in the world but in the meantime um, I go down the road to Augustino's bakery and it's this mom and pop shop super tiny they're open on Wednesdays and Saturdays only the most phenomenal sourdough and every single kind of dessert and quiche and croissant that you will ever see in your life you if you live in Greensboro or even if you don't and you can drive here and it makes sense I would highly recommend. It is so good and they are so nice in there. Favorite meal to cook? Uh, anything that's like super colorful at the beginning. So whether that's something that requires you to cook like peppers and celery and tomatoes and onions together like a chili base or something that is like caramelizing onions. Um, something that starts off like that. It, and that's normally like super long cooking times for all of those too and yeah I really like those I did also and if I remember editing me um needs to remember to put a link for um scratch pantry um that's the website it's from acre homestead her name is Becky and she has the best tikka masala recipe that I've ever had it was so good and I made um homemade naan bread with it I'll link that recipe too that's a perfect meal. Absolutely divine. Um, and it's easy to make. You caramelize onions in the beginning, but it is, the payoff is amazing. Like I, it makes me seem like a much better cook than I am. Someone asked, <laughs> by someone, I mean, Mark Johnson asked for my secret apple cobbler recipe. And I had to correct him when we went to the movies. I have not ever made him an apple cobbler. I made him a peach cobbler, and that is the recipe that I always go back to. It is so easy. It is dummy proof, and if you've got super ripe, they have to be really ripe. So, like, buy them and then let them start to rot on your counter. Like, they need to be really, really ripe. It's the best. And then some homemade vanilla ice cream. Fabulous. I will link that recipe. What am I most nervous about for the new place? I think it's kind of... Um, two different things. I'm nervous about failing at gardening, which I know is going to happen in, in some capacity. And I'm just trying to be prepared for that. So we'll see what happens. But, um, yeah, I think that, <laughs> and I think just getting into the rhythm of things like recreating my life and having a different lifestyle. I mean, it, it will change the way that I live my life and I'm not going to be able to just pop out to Target whenever I want. You know, I definitely still can. It's not like I'm an hour away from anything, but I'll have to be more intentional about the way I live my life, how I plan and all that stuff. So yeah, that's really, really intriguing to me and nerve wracking and intriguing. And I'm going to end on an intense one pretty much. Um, and I've got a couple of things to say on this. And this is my own personal experience. I'm not telling you to feel this way. I'm not making a judgment on you if you feel differently or you live your life in a different way or you've made a d different choice for yourself. That's for you to make. Um, but this this has been my experience and my journey with it. So I chose not to have children 
and I got my tubes taken out. So what most people get done is get their tubes tied. And I didn't want any chance that that was going to get messed up or not be effective. So I had them actually cut my fallopian tube in two places and then remove that section of the fallopian tube. So I still have my ovaries. I still have all of that stuff. I just don't have that section of my fallopian tube. There's no connection. Sorry if this is TMI also. <laughs> Whoops. I, I guess we're already a little bit past that. But um, I had never had any pressure from anyone to have children. I feel really lucky with that. That decision, I, I have felt that way since I was 18. Um, I've felt really strongly about that for the majority of my life. And it was, I didn't have to convince anyone else. Um, I was lucky enough to find a person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with that doesn't want kids either. So I can't speak to anything other than that. I, I was really lucky in that regard. I think that's a, a conversation you need to have really early on in dating someone if you want to spend the rest of your life with them. I, I think that's important to talk about. Maybe not on the first date, but I, I do think that you need to be on the same page with that. And if not, you need to figure out what you're going to do. Um, but I, I got no pressure from my family on that at all. Um, it was, weirdly enough, pressure from doctors. So from the time that I was 18, I've been on birth control probably since I was 13 to control my cycles and stuff because they're absolutely horrendous. I'm not on birth control anymore. Obviously, I don't need to be. So they're still horrendous. But um, it it was a thing where, and I'm going to try not to get too in the, into the weeds on this because um, I think this is this is a very personal journey and a very personal topic. But this is just an anecdote from me and my my lived experience. They did not want to allow me to have my tubes tied, just have my tubes tied, which is technically reversible until I was 35 and or married. Um, so yeah, that was not what I wanted, be it I was young and I, I am very grateful to them for having those conversations with me and having that necessity of me being really cautious of making decisions when I'm really young. And again, I started asking for this at 18, not any younger than that. But they said, you know, you might change your mind. And that was their, you know, big thing. And for doctors, it's supposed to be do no harm. And you're not supposed to allow a I mean, I was an adult in the legal sense, but I was definitely still a child to make that kind of life altering decision to not be able to have children if one day I wanted them or say I met the love of my life and they wanted children to not give me that option or to make me think about that would have been neglect on their part. And I, I commend them for making me think about that. Do I believe that that needs to be worked on a little bit? Do I feel like those guidelines are a little rigid? Yes. Do I feel like I should have been able to sign Something that, you know, said this is irreversible. Uh, here are what your options are if you want to freeze your eggs beforehand. Here are your options for having a pregnancy. Uh, should you do this and still want to get pregnant? Like, yes, yes, yes. All of that. I waited till I was 27. I was very lucky that because um, I went to a couple different gynecologists. I didn't hop around, but I like every four or five years, I would end up going to a different one just because I moved or whatever. And I found one that actually listened to me and she spoke with another gynecologist on um, at her workplace and they said that they had done uh, a tubal ligation on someone that was my age and that person never regretted it and had any issues. And, you know, I had I had promised every gynecologist that I had ever been with. I was like, I'll sign whatever you want me to sign. I'll have my mom come in and sign if you feel like I can't make this decision. And again, I'm happy. I am happy that they made me wait because at 18, I was in no place to make that decision on whether or not I was going to ruin my chances of being able to get pregnant should I want to. That is an, that's an almost irreversible decision that I was making. And I, am, I was not an adult enough at that point, even at 18, to make that choice at all. And uh, they finally listened to me at 27 
And I knew that I was going to be with Luke. I mean, in my head, that was that was my thought process. And I had that done when I was 27. Um, the recovery was very easy for me. Again, I'm not recommending this to people. I'm just sharing my personal experience. And I have not regretted that decision. I still do not want biological children. That's not something that I, I want to do. First off, there's cancer on both sides of my family, mother and father, mental health issues, alcoholism, addiction, all of that. I do not want to feel like I am, should I ever choose to have children, which again is not on my plan at all, uh, biological or otherwise, but I didn't want to ever saddle another human being with all of the issues that I know that I had faced that have a huge potential and real genetic component to that. So I just, I didn't want to take that chance. So I I have not regretted that decision, but I made that decision at 27. That's when they felt that I was capable of making that decision. Now there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, the current political climate is a little crazy with it. Making decisions about your reproductive health is a huge choice. It's a choice that should be thought about a lot that you should have counseling from outside sources, doctors, therapy, all of that. And I do believe that you need to live a good chunk of your life before you're going to actually be able to know who you are, what you want, and to be able to make that choice. Making it as a child, making an irreversible decision about your fertility as a child is crazy to me. And the fact that the laws are different, I needed to be 35 and married but there are certain situations where literal children can make this choice to never be able to have kids does not make any sense to me that those two things do not line up in my brain anyway. Again, this is just because of my lived experience. I don't see how those two can be in the same doctor's brain that a woman, a, gr a grown adult, a, a straight female for all intents and purposes that is with a partner for five years, can't make the choice to have her tubes tied, but a child can choose to take drugs that are going to, in effect, have the same outcome. Their fertility is going to go away. They are not going to be able to have children of their own biologically. And this this has nothing to do with Politics for me, it is just something that I've thought about a lot because of what I went through. And I know that everyone has their own opinion on this, as they should. I think you should really take a long, hard look at what the the, the reason that you believe what you believe behind that. And I'm really lucky that I did have a situation in my life with my own fertility that I had the opportunity to really look at, okay, what... What are my morals and ethics behind this? Because I was very angry when I was 18. I was like, this is what I want. I know what I want. I've known it forever. I'm never going to change my mind. You don't know me. I am the most decision-making person in the entire world. And at that point, I was still drinking alcoholically. So there is no way that I should have been <laughs> let to make that choice. And I feel so lucky that I had people in my life to show me, hey, you can still make this decision in the future if that's still what you want. But here's what work you need to do on the inside in between now and then. Here's how you make sure that you're not going to make a decision that is irreversible and you're going to live to regret it for the rest of your life. I, I am seriously blessed to have had the doctors and the people in my life tell me that. And again, the outcome was the same. I still made that decision. However, I would have made it for the wrong reasons had I done it earlier. And I would not have done the work on the inside to know that I can stand firm in that choice. So I know that's kind of like a long answer and probably uh, went a little deeper than you thought when you asked me that. But I would say to really take the time to be honest with yourself um, to go to therapy to see if there's an underlying reason why you don't want to have children. That is a that was a huge component for me. So making sure that that's not why you're making your decision was really, I mean, that's it was really important for me. So I would caution anyone that's thinking about that to to think of, to, to just take that time and take a good long hard look at yourself and your childhood and uh, your parental situation and see if that's why you're making that choice. 
and to be open to the fact that your mind might change um, and it's not up to you to convince anyone. I, I did feel like I had to convince the doctors to let me do it. And I feel really good that I did advocate for myself, but I had to learn how to speak. I had to learn how to stand firm in my belief system. And that means I had to know what I believed. That, that means I had to know what my morals and values were surrounding that topic. I had to be able to explain to them why, why now, and why I wasn't going to regret it. And I, I think that's, it's important to look at all of those and ask yourself those hard questions um, so that if a family member or a doctor or whoever questions you on it or, you know, gives you pushback, you can feel comfortable speaking from what you know you want for yourself and not worry about convincing them. <laughs> I mean, it really is you knowing that this is for you and that's what you want to do. And then the rest is them and their work and they have to do that too. So yeah, I am so excited about the new vibe that's going on in here. I'm so excited that you joined me and uh, the next episode that you will see, like I said, will be the person that uh, bought the lovely couch that we used to sit on. And we're still sitting on that couch in that episode, by the way. So the next uh, two guest episodes, you'll still see the couch because those are pre-recorded. This one is pretty much live at this point. I'm recording the day before I post it. So if you've got any thoughts, questions, um, you know, really strong opinions about anything that I said, please let me know in the comments. I love having these discussions. I love all the comments that I've been getting since changing the format of this podcast. You all have been so supportive and I appreciate that so much. And the conversations that we're able to have that these come, you know, I mean, the way that we talk, it does spark more. It, it gives uh, an avenue to go deeper if you want to. So if you do, comment on this video or on the podcast that you're listening to. Leave us a review. Um, I think I'm supposed to say subscribe and thumbs up. I'm new to this whole YouTube thing. I'm just doing what Luke normally says. So please, please, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. That would be wonderful. We almost got 400 subscribers. I am absolutely shocked. I still, every day I look at it, I'm like, wow. It, it's It's just amazing that I can get on here and do something that's creative for me and is something that I want to talk about and other people actually want to talk about it too. So again, thanks so much for joining me and 